Hello and welcome to the teacher's staff room. This is a video for the CTEC Level 3 Business Examination for Unit 1, the Business Environment, for the 10th of January 2024, and specifically Section B, which is the pre-release which has been issued by the awarding body and the research that needs to be carried out on the particular themes which they give in a research brief. Now, if you have a copy of this PowerPoint, then you can follow this along and then make your own notes in your PowerPoint. However, if you do not have a copy of this PowerPoint, do not worry. I have added a link in the description below of where you can get hold of it. However, you do not necessarily need this. You could just open up your own PowerPoint and add the different sections based on this video. So let's get started. So as I say, the exam is 10th of January 2024 and it is a two hour examination. There is only one paper, but it is split into three different sections. So section A comprises of multiple choice questions. So you'll have 20 of those to answer. Then section B comprises of short answer questions and questions requiring more extended responses based on pre-released research briefs. So that's what we're looking at today. And then section C comprises of short answer questions and questions requiring more extended responses again, based on an unseen scenario, which we tend to call a case study. Now you'll be pleased to know you can take a calculator into the exam, but what that does mean is that you will probably get in questions which require a calculator to answer. So particularly finance questions is where you're gonna be using your calculator. So this exam is graded near pass, pass, merit or distinction. However, we don't see the distinction star as a grade for this exam. You are able to achieve a distinction star once you have completed this exam, completed your coursework units. We add up the points and then if you have enough points, that's where you will see the distinction star grading come in. So here is the instructions for this particular PowerPoint. As I say, if you haven't got it, then just open up your own PowerPoint. That's absolutely fine. And add sections as we go along. And remember as well that you can come back to this video at any point before the exam. You can pause it as we go through, go at it at your own pace. It's down to you to decide how to use this video. So as part of your examination in January, you are required to carry out your own research. Use this document to place all of the research in one place. And that's really important. You know, don't have, you know, a, a page of notes here and a, a, maybe a PowerPoint there. This is designed so that you literally can have it all at one place ready for when you come to obviously revise for that exam. And if you do have a copy of this PowerPoint, just be aware you can add pages. This is not to say that this PowerPoint is set in stone. You use it how you want to use it. Or it may well be that your teacher has edited your version of the PowerPoint and there's some additional pages that your teacher would like you to focus on as well. So use what you want. You can add tables, graphs, diagrams, even a YouTube video. So it's how best will help you revise. The, the given here is the more research you do, the more prepared you'll be for the questions in the section B of the exam. And that goes without saying, really. Um, if you are leaving everything to the last minute and you're briefly sort of, you know, reading over this research brief before you go into the exam, then do not expect to obviously score highly. You know, those students that prepare thoroughly for section B score highly. Now, for my students, I always set this as a mandatory piece of work and say that they cannot sit the exam unless this is complete. And again, it's because as a teacher, we are responsible for ensuring that you are prepared to sit that exam. So if you haven't carried out your research, then are you prepared to sit that exam? So make sure that you follow the instructions of your teacher. If they would like this handed in as a project, then obviously follow those instructions. Um, and uh, yeah, basically 
uh, make sure you do this revision because the amount of um, students um, that I see because I have marked this exam haven't prepared at all. They literally have sat the exam with very little preparation and that's where they come unstuck uh, because they're literally not able to answer the questions. So please do not fall into that category. That is why this help is available so that you can go in and get the best grade possible. So here we go then, this has come out from OCR. So you should carry out your own research on the themes given in this research brief. You are advised to research a number of different types of businesses. Your research will help you prepare for your examination. Your research is only for your own use. You must not bring your notes into the examination. A clean copy of this research brief will be provided. And that's where I'd like to make a note as well, because if your teacher has issued you this PowerPoint and they would like you to actually do additional businesses on top of the one in this particular PowerPoint, which will become clear in a minute, then by, by all means, follow your teacher's instructions. But again, as a marker for this exam, for the awarding body, I can tell you I have marked papers where students have focused on one business or two businesses. And this year, I instead of doing the five businesses, I've drilled it down to the one because all of these themes that you need to research can fit into one business but as I say if your teacher would like you to look at different types of businesses so for example something from the private sector something from the public sector something from the voluntary slash charity sector then again you follow their instructions but as I say, I found that all of these themes fitted nicely into one. And I can assure you that when your paper is marked, uh, the examiner is not looking at the number of businesses you have covered. I can promise you that. It's just if you can answer the questions. So here is the research that you need to carry out. So number one. Employee protection in the workplace. Number two, how a tool organisation structure affects business performance. Number three, pressure groups in action. Number four, how businesses respond to changes in disposable income. Number five, factors that have contributed to the success of the business. And as I say, in the past, we would do a business for each of those. So you would have done five businesses. But as I say, I've made it as simple as possible this year so that we can get some quality answers and maximise those, those, those marks. Uh, the questions in section B of the examination will require you to draw in your knowledge and understanding which you have gained while researching these themes. And also it's important to note, it's knowledge that you have gained throughout learning the whole of unit one. So none of these things should be a surprise. Your teacher would have carried out all of these lessons where you have focused on each of these separate learning outcomes and therefore you're going into that exam, exam having been taught this stuff and now you've researched it and you're going to apply it to a business. So if you do have the PowerPoint, then this is where it's your chance to put your information in ready for your revision. So everything in the next section is leading up to you being able to answer those research themes. So as I say, this year I have focused on one business, which is Tesco's, because you can actually work those themes all into the one business. But again, follow your teacher's instructions if they do want you to look at some other business types as well. So looking at number one, employee protection in the workplace. This comes under learning outcome six. So understand the external influences and constraints on a business and how businesses could respond. And there we go. If we drill down to 6.1, we're looking at legal factors. And then if we look on the right hand side, when we're talking about legal factors, we are talking about things such as employee protection and under employee protection we include the following bits of legislation. So the Equality Act, 
Health and Safety at Work Act, Working Time Directive and National Minimum Wage. And the implication of failing to meet the legal requirements. So there's a financial implication, which obviously could be fines, which are issued by courts and non-financial um, implications, which could be things such as effect on reputation. And that's also a non-legal implication as well. So what we are planning is focusing in on that learning uh, outcome there, learning outcome six. We're going to drill down to employee protection by having a look at all four of those different bits of legislation and then the implication of failing to meet those four Tesco employees. So the next part is from the textbook. So if you want to read through and obviously pause this video so that you can refresh your memory on what we mean by employee protection and those different laws, then you do have that information here on this slide. And then we get into your research. So anything on, with, on a slide with a cream background is for you to then obviously carry out the research for these particular themes. So what I've done here is I've, I've given a little space so that you can write your definition. So what do we mean by employee protection? So just be clear in your mind. If you had a question asking you, what is employee protection in the workplace? What would you say? How would you explain that? So just put that into your own words in that space there. And then because I have absolutely no idea what element of employee protection is going to come up in the exam, so I don't know what is going to be questioned, it's best that we cover all four of those different types of legislation. So that's where the textbook stuff, you can obviously read through that, get it straight in your mind, and then come up with an example here for Tesco's. So for example, if we take the Equality Act, you're going to read through the Equality Act. <clears throat> And then you're going to talk, you're going to give an example of what Tesco's will do to protect their employees in relation to the Equality Act. And then the same for minimum wage, the same for working time directive and the same for health and safety. So you're just thinking of little examples of what they would put in place. And remember, because these are legal implications, by law, they have to follow them. So for example, they have to be paying at least the minimum wage, otherwise they are breaking the law. They have to be following working time directive, otherwise they're breaking the law. So literally give yourself just a, a very brief example of how Tesco's would be working with their employees to protect them because of this legislation. And I've just put a note there. These are all laws which apply to businesses. Be prepared that any could be questioned, which is what I said anyway. And then on the next slide then, this is where in particular, I'm gonna get you to drill down into one of those laws. So what I have done here is added a link. It's gonna take you straight to the diversity and inclusion that's offered at Tesco's. You're going to have a read around that page and then you're going to summarise it in your own words. So what specifically does Tesco's do to, to protect their employees when it comes to diversity and inclusion? And remember, the diversity inclusion is linked to the Equality Act. That is what they've had to put in place because it is a legal requirement. So read that link through, and then you're gonna summarize that on this slide here. Now, what you might want to do is add a few more slides and do exactly the same for the minimum wage, exactly the same for working time directive, and exactly the same for the Health and Safety Act, so that you are using the Tesco website, www.tesco.com, you're finding the information of what they specifically have put in place for each of those bits of legislation to protect their employees. 
And remember as well, think about the implications. So why have they put them in place? And again, that comes back to that first slide because otherwise there's fines. So we're seeing a real financial impact there. It's gonna cost them, in some cases, it could be hundreds of thousands, if not millions of pounds, if they break these laws. And then obviously think about the non-financial implications, non-legal implications, which are bad reputation. It might be loss of customers. Your brand is gonna take a hit because people will associate your brand with you know lower poor working conditions you may then not be able to recruit things like that so just make sure you cover all bases because again I, you know i don't know what questions will come up but certainly it's going to be along these themes and this year what i have done is brought it all together and given you an example of a particular answer and this one's in relation to if, for example, it came up that health and safety was being questioned in the exam. So here we go. Tesco protects its employees by, um, in, uh, sorry, I can't even read my own writing there, by ensuring employees' health and safety is maintained. This means that employees feel safe in the workplace. For example, a store assistant will be stacking shelves with food. This must have, sorry, and must have the right safety equipment slash ladder. If they do not do this, this could lead to Tesco's facing costly court fines, which would impact their profits if fined. And obviously in that particular example, I didn't sort of elaborate that if they didn't have the right safety equipment, it could lead to accidents in the workplace. But, but it's just to give you a, a, a kind of idea of where you would be bringing this all together. So your knowledge of employee protection, that particular law, and then where it leads to for the business. Now, what I have done as well is put some bits in blue. This is showing the examiner that one, you've absolutely applied it to Tesco's because we're talking about store assistance, stacking shelves, food, which is relevant to this business. And then this could lead to, so they want to see that you can then join it all up and what the impact is for the business. So there you go, and on this particular example I've given is profit. Now I've given a space underneath, you'll see on the other ones I have put now your turn, but underneath you might want to now give an example again for the Equality Act, for minimum wage, for working time directive, and if that needs you to add some more slides, then feel free to add some more slides. But it's ready prepared kind of answers that you will then be revising over and over again so that you are confident once those questions appear in the paper. Then going on to number two, the theme is how a tool organisation structure affects business performance. So this comes under learning outcome three, which is understand the effect of different organisational structures on how businesses operate. And then if we drill down to 3.1, we're looking at the different structures. And here we have a hierarchical slash tool structure, which is the one that we know questions will come up. Now, looking at the specification, what you'll see here that under 3.1, 3.2, 3.3, these are all relevant bits of information that in theory could be questioned. So on 3.1, it could be that we're looking at structures to where an organisation has structured by function, by product or service, or by geographical location. So it could be a tool structure, for example, that spans over a number of different countries. Uh, we could, at 3.2, be talking about or asked a question in relation to how the organisation has divided up their work. So how are the sub subtasks distributed amongst uh, the employees? How the functional areas kind of all fit together in terms of a tool structure? And then 3.3, the implications again. So we're talking about when we have a tool structure and maybe we've devised our organisation by function, it means it's easier to delegate tasks to subordinates. Authority can be delegated. Responsibility obviously cannot 
So a manager is a manager, they still are a manager, but they could possibly ask other people in the organisation to take on some particular tasks. Uh, it might be questions in relation to span of control. So with a tool structure, remember we've got a, a, a long chain of command, but a shorter span of control. So we could see questions coming up about that. And also we may see questions including things such as the advantages and disadvantages of that structure and the appropriateness of the structure for that particular business. So just be aware, this is from the specification. They've given us this theme, but any of the questions could be around these points here. So let's have a look at the textbook. So I, I apologize that this is slightly blurry. Hopefully you have a copy of the uh, textbook to hand anyway. And um, here you go, I've, I've put in the advantages and disadvantages of uh, tool structures and given you a little diagram there of what we mean by tool structure. So uh, we have many hierarchical layers within that organization structure. So again, feel free to pause, read through this at your own leisure, just to refresh your mind on the detail and the knowledge needed for this particular theme. And here we go then. So I found this little diagram. Um, absolutely, Tesco's has a tool structure and we actually see it devised in the UK by um, sort of function. Uh, therefore, um, as uh, this, this little um, diagram shows you, we will have like a fresh food section. We have ambient food section, the electronic section, the clothing section, etc, etc. So absolutely, they are a tool structure and they have created this structure based on function. So again, a space here for you to put your definition. So what is a tool organization structure? So in your own words, you know, just recap that, put it in so it's ready there for when you revise. Um, and there you go, I've told you, Tesco's has a tool structure. So just write that out, you know, write that explanation. How would you put that if you were to put that into an exam question where you're explaining about Tesco's organization structure? And give an example. So here we go. We've got, we have got the organization chart here or a very simplified one. You know, talk about the different functions. For example, the ones I just read out, you know, put that in and say, for example, they have a fresh food section, but write it into your own words, into your own way that you would actually write that if that was an actual exam question. And this is um, slightly, slightly different to um, the, uh, the other slides, but you now need to think about what is the impact on Tesco's performance. Now, in order to do that, really focus on the advantages and disadvantages from the textbook. So why is it good to have a tool organization structure? What are the advantages to Tesco's operating this way? And then what is the downside to having that tool structure? So again, maybe think about chain of command, span of control, you know, what is the impact to the business? And remember, with tool structures, we are talking about very, very many levels of communication, you know, having to travel from top to bottom before possibly decisions are made. So we're talking could be a very slow moving organization to respond to the external environment for example so just have a real good think based on those advantages and disadvantages of um, how it's going to affect their business operation and then again what would this lead to so if we've got a really slow business that you know takes many people to get decisions made how is that going to impact the business? You know, is that going to lead to, for example, more sales or less sales, more market share, less market share? Is it going to lead to possibly attracting more customers or less customers? Because, you know, do the decisions in Tesco's happen quickly or do they take time? And therefore, if they're taking time, potentially that could possibly be 
you know, a disadvantage to them performing well against other organisations if other organisations have flatter structures. So um, don't necessarily have to go <clears throat> to off anywhere to research this particular theme but by all means have a look on www.tesco.com there will be additional stuff on there particularly if you look at their financial performance reports um, in terms of um, how they're performing um, or their sort of annual accounts they will have them on there because they are plc um, it may well be there's some additional stuff that you can bring through really to you know make that that example that you're going to have to hand really fantastic so then we've got a bring it all together slide so again i've given you a bit of an example here so tesco plc have a tall organization structure this has been really positive for the business as they've organized the functions with a clear division between each department this has led to each section such as the bakery section having a manager with expert knowledge to train new employees in bread making leading to more sales revenue at and customers, oh, sorry, as customers know, the fresh the fresh bread is of high quality, et cetera, et cetera. And again, what I did is I just went to that table, picked out some advantages there, but be prepared to obviously, it could be that we're focusing on the disadvantages if the question comes up. So be prepared for both, looking at both sides of that. And again, I've put the bits in blue for what the examiner is looking for. So we're looking for things specific to Tesco so that we know that we've applied this knowledge to this business. So we've got bakery there, we've got bread making, we've got bread, and then we've got the lead to. So we're talking about sales re revenue there. Um, again, you could take that further and say sales revenue profit or you know market share, but you have a lead to. And I've given you a space for you to obviously practice your ones in there as well. And then number three theme is pressure groups in action. So this comes under learning outcome five and understanding the relationship between businesses and stakeholders. So we can drill that down to 5.1 where we look in the specification. We've got uh, internal, external stakeholders and then 5.2 where we look at different stakeholder groups to try and alter business behavior. And then um, 5.2 as well, they, they're, they're saying here, consider practical examples from the real from real businesses, e.g. an environmental pressure group could protest about expansion plans of a business causing negative media publicity and a customer boycott um, or denial of, of planning permission. So I'm taking you through the specification there of potentially what could come up as particular questions. So again, bits from the textbook here of what is a pressure group. So we are talking about an external stakeholder here. So be clear that you know the details of what a pressure group is and then how businesses respond to the different pressure groups. And then I've got a table over here from the textbook, which is benefits and drawbacks of meeting stakeholder needs. So this is potentially all of the information that you can obviously bring through for a ready-made, hope, hopefully potential answer, um, and obviously based on potentially questions that will come up. So for pressure groups in action, then again, so give us a definition of a pressure group. So in your own words, and then looking at Tesco's, it looks like, I think it was 2020, there was a particular pressure group called Farmers for Climate Action, which um, they, they've inserted the word climate, because I think they were called Farmers for Action, uh, but obviously climate change obviously is hot topic, so they've probably updated their company name there. So... I've given you a link through to the website. Who are they and what do they do? So there's a bit of information on their website. Um, they were lobbying over a particular uh, EU Brexit uh, potential you know, policies that were coming in in relation to farming. So I've given you the article there. Um, and they wrote a letter to Tesco's, putting pressure on Tesco's to take action. But obviously, have a look at both of those links. 
read them through and then you're going to add your research to this slide and again be thinking as you read through and putting your own bits onto this slide what is the impact on the pressure groups on tesco so by having farmers for climate action pressuring tesco's what is the impact on tesco's what do they have to do in relation to these stakeholders are they going to listen to them are they going to take action um, could it be that for example if they don't listen to the stakeholders what could be the implications could it get worse if not better those sorts of things because again we don't know what is going to come up in those questions so be prepared to think about both sides of listening to them and not listening to them which is your sort of advantages and disadvantages of that table on the previous slide so i've said they use the table slide 15 on slide 15 to consider what may be happening inside and outside the business and again we're going to go what does it lead to so positively listening and then not listening and then come up with a, a response uh, in here uh, not necessarily a sponsor your research based on those things but thinking around what does that lead to for the business and I've kind of I, I didn't want to give you everything so I've given you a brief example here for you to kind of you know know where you would bring your detail in so we're bringing it all together for a prepared answer so Tesco's has seen pressure groups in action over the last few years one group Farmers in Climate Action um, have blah de blah de blah so whatever they've done yeah, so reading from the article Tesco's listened to these stakeholders who put pressure on Tesco's to commit to and again you'll find that in the article this leads to stakeholders needs being satisfied and Tesco's were able to so what did they do by listening or to these stakeholders what were they able to do and then their, uh, their fresh produce leading to good reputation, higher sales, more profit. So I, I wanted to put a, an example in here, but I didn't want to kind of um, make it so you didn't have to read the article. So it just kind of uh, shows you where you kind of go with this answer. Um, so I've left a space again for you to uh, come up with the complete answer there. But again, remember, look at the good side of listening, look at the bad side of listening. So you might actually write two different examples in here. Now, I've made a slight mistake. Oh, no, I haven't. Sorry, I've put the, the bold in... Um, in black rather than blue on this slide so the bold is the leads to and fresh produce which obviously is related to tesco's but also even the mention of the of the name of the pressure group so farmers in climate action would also be seen as application because um, it is absolutely applicable to that business you're not going to find that particular climate group for example um, lobbying the NHS so we can use that as context um, for this particular business and then theme four how businesses respond to changes in disposable income this comes under learning outcome six as well and uh, it comes under the external environment and then looking at um, social factors, um, which is there under the sort of bullet point one. And then if we drill down into 6.1, we have to include social factors such as demographic issues, attitudes to work, disposable income, social trends and cultural beliefs. So from the specification, that is what you're expected to know. And here is what it says in the textbook. So we've got a little bit there on what is a social factor and then the bits there on disposable income. So again, read this through, make sure that you understand what the knowledge is behind what is going to come up in the questions. So again, put your definition in. What do we mean by disposable income? So in your own words, what what would you say to that if you were asked and then what is a social factor so again what would you say to that if that was asked and then why must tesco respond to social factors so 
really have a think yourself. It's a very hot topic at the moment, especially in the UK, because the economy um, is, is very up and down. And I have given you a link there um, to a particular article that talks about what's happening in the economy. Okay, we are in a very difficult situation. You probably know yourselves that we've seen a lot of prices increase and we've got disposable incomes coming down and therefore businesses are having to respond um, and therefore Tesco's have to respond to the social factors. If they don't respond to social factors, then we potentially will have customers that may be priced out of their supermarket because they're unable to afford the particular food that they offer, for example. So what can they do to ensure that they have customers still shopping in stores? So what we um, do when we look at um, social factors and disposable incomes is we think about when when prices are high, more customers will be swapping to lower priced items, which we call substitute items. So it may well be, for example, Tesco branded food. We may see an increase in products that they offer in those types of situations where incomes um, are, are much lower. Or, for example, they may be looking at attracting more customers. So be, by giving offers such as, you know, buy six bottles of wine, get 25% off. So again, really appealing to those lower incomes, disposable incomes that everyone's facing at the moment. They certainly as well will be in competition with all the supermarkets. There'll be lots and lots of different price wars going on to attract those customers um, and Tesco's, for example, have been doing the Audi price match for quite a while now because Audi is seen as one of the big low cost supermarkets that offer these sort of substitute products. Um, and therefore, Tesco's have to, uh, you know, be competitive against these types of supermarkets. Otherwise, they will be losing market share to them. And then we have the club card, which... Um, Club card is revolutionary in itself, but we've seen major improvements to the club card where we're seeing real significant prices being discounted on items for those people that have the club card. It gives them the power to lower those prices. So what we have seen is particularly at the moment, um, uh, everyone's disposable income going down and then Tesco's responding particularly on price um, in order to keep their market share, to keep those sales high and profit high as well. So there you go. Um, if you click on that link there, it will take you through to a bit of information about uh, the particular value range for Tesco's. And remember, it is about responding to those external constraints. So, um, you know, this is happening because of what is happening in the economy right now. So this is for you to then bring it all together, a bit of, you know, writing up of what is happening, how Tesco's is responding onto this slide. And again, bringing it all together then. So here's an example. Instead of me giving you an example this time, but this is what I would expect to be seeing if um, a question came up along these lines and, and what the sort of keywords you'd be bringing into that response. So we're talking about value ranges, respond to disposable income, low income, higher incomes as well. So obviously when there are higher incomes, we have Tesco's bringing out their finest range. So their own label ranges, but for people on higher income. So just be aware as well that it may be a question about higher incomes. So Tesco's have obviously uh, placed themselves in a position where they can cater for low and high, which is good. But particularly at the moment, they're trying to get those low incomes, low disposable income shoppers through the door. 
Um, so we've got branded own food, own label food, groceries, finest range, competitors, Audi and price match. And again, leading to higher sales, profit, market share, etc, etc. So that's the sort of keywords I would expect to see somewhere in an example if you were writing. And again, make sure that you're absolutely um, talking in context, which means applying to Tesco specifically. So the key words that would apply it specifically to Tesco's would be things like finest range or their competitors such as Audi or, um, you know, our Audi price match, because that is something specific to Tesco's. And then the last one then, the last theme, number five, factors that have contributed to success of a business. So this comes under learning, um, a, out, I can't speak now, learning outcome number eight of the specification. And if we drill down there into 8.1, we've got factors affecting success, failure of a business. So we've got financial, non-financial, short-term, long-term. And then 8.1 to include past and present success slash failure. So what I've done again is I've given you the information from the textbooks that you're fully aware of what we mean by the success factors or failure factors because we're talking about financial and non-financial factors again. So read that through, pause it at your own leisure, take down your notes and then here's the slide for you to put your information on. So what do we mean by financial factors? What do we mean by non-financial factors? So what has Tesco's achieved as a business which has contributed to their success? And then non-financial, what has Tesco's achieved as a business which has contributed to their success? Meaning looking at both of these, could you write down something as an example where they have been really successful and it's based on financial factors, non-financial factors. Now, this is where you can really go to town with your research. I've given you three links there um, which cover financial and non-financial factors um, which are applicable to Tesco's. So the first one is a, a really great article about how they've become the UK's biggest retailer. And that is absolutely going to be linking to the financial factors. So, of course, you know, if you look at their market share, they've got the biggest market share in the UK. Um, and I think as, as it stands today, I think every... Uh, pound and eight is spent in Tesco. So this is a massive financial factor that has led to the success of Tesco's. Uh, they're obviously a PLC, so they uh, floated on the stock market as well, so they should sell shares. So that has been how they've been able to obviously get um, revenue into the business and grow the business to the size that it is today. And then non-financial factors Really and truly, it is focusing on their club card, which if you look at the non-financial factors on the textbook page, what you will find is they talk about um, meeting customer needs and listening to customers. And the Tesco club card has absolutely been the defining success of Tesco's for that very reason, that they're able to listen they're able to um, target customers because they have so much data that they are able to use that data um, and through that data it's given them competitive advantage and obviously this big market share. So um, there's three links for you to obviously uh, get your teeth into to try and obviously set yourself out with the financial and non-financial factors for their success. And again, last but not least, Tesco's have enjoyed a major success due to non-financial factors such as understanding their customers. They have successfully achieved this by using Tesco Club Card as a way to reward their customers for shopping and gain important information which has led them to, be, to being able to target customers with specific offers on food and clothing, which has led to an increase in sales and market share, 
etc etc but please be aware again obviously i don't know what the question will be that comes up it may well be questioning on financial factors so again if you want to do more than just the links that are on this slide go to www.tesco.com and have a look at their annual reports have a look at what uh, they're publishing to their shareholders and the investors because in there you're going to see a lot of financial information you're going to see what for example the share prices are or what they've used the finance to then you know grow in terms of you know store openings and things like that so it really is um, up to you to obviously do anything additional just to cover all bases because we, as I say, we don't know quite what is going to come up. But just lastly to say on this one, the blue um, writing again is, is how you would tell the examiner that you are applying it specifically in context to Tesco. So we've got the club card there that is specific to that business. And again, food and clothing specific to that business. And again, the leads to sales and market share. So a long video, I know, but hopefully you have found it of interest and hopefully has given you some instructions of how to obviously pull this research together. Um, as I say, the link for the PowerPoint, if you want to get hold of a copy, I've put the link in the description below. Um, potentially if you are a student you could possibly ask your teacher whether they could try and get hold of that for you because uh, there is a minimum a minimal charge sorry for uh, downloading it which is from the test website um, but if you do not have the powerpoint do not want to get the powerpoint then by all means you know just make up your own document I will be back with some more helpful tips and really useful information on how to maximise your grade on the rest of the exam coming up very, very shortly. So please obviously like and subscribe and hopefully I will see you in the next video. Many thanks. Speak to you soon. Bye.